Good evening and welcome to the Finger Lakes Wine Alliance Virtual Tasting Series. My name is Jeff Houck. I'm going to be our moderator this evening for the Wine Alliance. Um, we're real excited tonight to share with you some of our sparkling and dessert wines from the Finger Lakes. Um, we feel they're some of the things that really stand out in the region and um, when we've done this type of tasting in the past we've had some great feedback and we're really excited to hear back from some of our media members and get a little give and take with our winemaker and owners tonight. And um, how our tasting this evening is going to start, we'll have two flights. We're going to start out with sparkling wine at the beginning of this first flight and the last wine is a cream sherry. And um, we're going to go through each wine, do a little introduction and uh, ask the winemakers or owners to tell us a little bit about how the wine was made and then we'll field some questions that we've had from the media. Um, our first uh, winemaker we have with us this evening is Steve DeFrancesco. Steve's a longtime veteran in the Finger Lakes. He's uh, the great winemaker at Glenora Wine Cellars. He's also affiliated with uh, Knapp Winery and Chateau Lafayette Renault Winery. And um, Steve is going to, has with him this evening 2005 uh, Brut. He's going to uh, talk a little bit about how that uh, sparkling wine was made. And uh, welcome, Steve. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, we're trying our 05 Brut. Uh, that has been disgorged for a few weeks. Um, we uh, just released it a few weeks ago. Actually, it's been disgorged longer than that, but um, just released uh, a couple of weeks ago. This was um, picked in 05, which was a pretty warm year. We uh, oftentimes say uh, in, here in the Finger Lakes, we get a warm year that's great for the reds, and, and a cool year is good for sparkling, but sometimes a warm year is good for sparkling, too. And um, uh, this was a warm year. We transitioned into a different grower for our Pinot Noir. Uh, so this was a young vineyard uh, at this point, and uh, typically our uh, classic method blends are about two-thirds Pinot Noir and one-third Chardonnay. This one's about 52% Chardonnay and 48% Pinot Noir, a little bit of a departure from what we normally do. And uh, it's got some pretty good acidity with uh, help from, um, uh, not Mother Nature, but <laughs> we uh, uh, bump that up a little bit to give it some crispness uh, and then um, dosage it with about uh, 12 grams per liter uh, of syrup and um, uh, it's been on the yeast since 06 so that's eight years on the yeasts. Uh, what kind of a uh, character could the uh, folks be looking for a uh, sparkling wine that spent that long on the leaves? Some really nice toasty aged uh, champagne like uh, flavors and, and the longer it's entourage like that on the yeasts, the more of those flavors you'll get, and, uh, more complexity and and uh, uh, then the dosage also adds some creaminess uh, and um, the fruit tends to uh, uh, diminish somewhat as as the complexity uh, builds up. And this would be like a prestige cuvee, like uh, they make in Champagne, France. Very good. And um, what's the suggested retail price of that one? Uh, this is twenty nine ninety nine. Very good. And um, could you just give us the quick explanation for our media members and people following Steve on the designation of sparkling wine versus champagne? Well, champagne is France. Uh, that's an area of France, and um, uh, I'm not sure what the laws say, but maybe it was grandfathered in that we could say champagne from before. Um, but uh, sparkling wines can be made anywhere. Champagne is uh, a sparkling wine made in France using uh, approved methods and uh, uh, varieties. Uh, and you make that sparkling wine, it actually fermented in that bottle. Yes. Um, did you just want to quickly touch on the other methods of sparkling yes. wine? We also uh, make uh, transfer method sparkling uh, that we uh, ferment in bottles uh, and then uh, using um, pretty sophisticated equipment from the 1970s. Um, uh, we transfer those bottles into a tank under pressure and then we can filter that uh, off of the yeast that comes out into a new tank that has dosage uh, and then it goes into brand new bottles. So we make uh, a couple of, we make three uh, sparkling lines of the transfer method which are uh, uh, much more uh, um, price uh, sensitive, uh, pretty nice products though. And you said that we had a question from one of our media members, which I think you already answered. Okay. This was recently disgorged, yes. right? Yeah. This, uh, you said like in the last month or so? Yes, we like to uh, disgorge uh, about four times a year. 
And okay. We, so we keep it on the entourage uh, all through the uh, aging and as needed, we uh, disgorge and go Sasha. Very good. Well, let me check, Steve, and see if we have any other questions for you. And um, if not, I believe that we're going to move on to our second wine of the night. Um, what was the production on your wine, Steve? Uh, we make about 500 cases a year, but this year in 05, uh, as we transitioned into a different vineyard for the Pinot Noir component, we um, actually cut way back to about uh, less than 200 cases on this one. So we'll be getting into the 06, actually, uh, fairly quickly. And that wine, um, if people were looking to get it, is it sold just through the winery? Uh, it's in distribution with uh, Empire um, in uh, upstate New York, uh, and it's available at the winery. And uh, we might have it in Florida, too, uh, in a few different places. Very good. Well, thank you very much, Steve. Yeah. And our um, second wine of the evening, Chateau Franks Celebre. Um, we have Fred Frank from uh, um, Chateau Frank, uh, from Dr. Frank, uh, Constantine Frank Wine Cellars. Uh, Fred is the owner and has been uh, with the business many years and uh, very well known in the region. Dr. Frank, great producer in our area. And I'm sure we'll get some good questions for Fred. And um, Fred, could you take us through, uh, tell us the retail price of that, tell us a little bit about how that wine was made. So, sure, thank you, Jeff. Um, this is one of my favorite wines uh, because it combines what I feel are two of the great strengths of our region, the Finger Lakes, namely Riesling and sparkling wine combined in this product. And this is a Metaux Champenois produced or traditional method, uh, meaning that it was fermented in the bottle or in this bottle. And um, this wine has a wonderful balance of residual sugar and acidity. And I think that's the key with Riesling and also the key with sparkling wine. So uh, this wine has really done well for us in competitions. Um, it retails for uh, $21. Uh, it is in general distribution, both in New York and uh, we're distributed in about 30 states. Uh, so it is available also at the winery. Um, it really has done well for us. For example, Wine and Spirits magazine uh, rated it this year as one of their top sparkling wines. It got a 90 rating. So it's exciting to see Finger Lake sparkling wines um, at, at, uh, rated at, at such a high level. Now, New York has a long tradition of sparkling wines going back 100 years or so, but uh, the, the prior, uh, the earlier attempts were with the native grapes, the Vitis Labrusca and some French hybrids. Uh, so my dad, Willie Frank, uh, started our sparkling uh, wine cellar from a, a historic winery, a stone cellar, um, right next to Dr. Frank's that's devoted exclusively to sparkling wine production. It has very deep cellars, so it's really ideal for the long-term aging of sparkling wines. Uh, we produce many uh, different styles. Uh, with the traditional champagne grapes like Chardonnay, Pinot Noir, and Pinot Meunier. But this is more a traditional German style or Alsatian style sparkling wine in that it's using just Riesling grape, 100% Riesling. So in Germany, this uh, style wine would be called Sekt, S-E-K-T. And we call it Finger Lake sparkling wine. Um, and um, it's really done well for us. We produce about eight to nine hundred cases a year um, and it's our most popular of all the sparkling wines. How long does that sit on the lees, Fred? Uh, this particular vintage was 2011. Uh, we do have uh, the more traditional uh, French style sparkling wines that age uh, you know longer on the on the yeast to get that nice yeasty complexity but with this wine we want some yeasty complexity but we also want to preserve that wonderful fruit from the Riesling grape. So it's kind of a balance between some age, but also preserving the wonderful fruitiness of the Riesling. Someone had asked a question for you also, Fred. Uh, do you think Finger Lakes uh, sparkling is a thing or is it a niche in the Finger Lakes? I think it really has a great future in the Finger Lakes. Um, you know, my dad started the cellars um, Back in 1984, Constantine started um, uh, our 
other wine in 1962, and he was the first to introduce the noble European wine grapes to the Finger Lakes. So it's really exciting for us as Finger Lakes producers to see Riesling now um, from the Finger Lakes considered as one of the best regions in the country. And so I really feel we've arrived there and I believe the next big trend for the Finger Lakes is going to be sparkling wines because we've been winning so many awards. In fact, my daughter Megan, as we speak, is accepting an award at Congress uh, where our uh, Congressman Tom Reed is presenting her with the Best of Show Award at the Atlantic Seaboard Wine Competition. So not only did this sparkling wine win best of class, it won best of show at this particular competition, which is the whole East Coast. So I feel that uh, sparkling wines in the Finger Lakes are, are really the next big thing, and we're really excited to be part of that. What is um, Chateau Frank's production of sparkling wine? Uh, the production is about three to 4,000 cases a year. So uh, this uh, type of metro champin, while we do hand riddling, hand disgorging, it's very labor intensive. But these techniques were developed by Dom Perignon hundreds of years ago, and we still follow them, and they're still used throughout the wine world to make the best quality sparkling wines. Very good. Well, thank you very much, Fred. Uh, lots of good information, and uh, I'm sure our, our media members really enjoy the wine. Um, we're going to move on to our third panelist tonight. We have with us uh, Chris Stamp from Lakewood Vineyards. Um, Lakewood uh, family-owned uh, vineyard. Chris, one of the owners and winemaker at Lakewood. And he has with us his uh, 2011 Blanc de Noir. Um, Chris, like our other panelists, I, I, I've got, I think I had this, the uh, experienced group up here first. These guys have, uh, actually we have some in both panels but these guys do a great job Chris uh, does an excellent job with Lakewood and he's gonna take us through the making of that 2011 Blanc de Noir um, thanks for coming Chris hey thanks uh, a little bit about this wine we every five years we do a sparkling wine it's uh, whether you uh, need to or not <laughs> well we're always out of the previous one let me say that uh, we don't do a large amount of it because as Fred said they're so labor-intensive and uh, we don't have a, a lot of extra labor, so uh, uh, it's one of those pet projects that we do because we we like doing it. I always call it the, the hand disgorging, a cathartic process. You just go over and you hand disgorge a little bit and cork them up, put the wire hoods on, uh, and you take them back and you wash them, and then you put labels on them, and then you put wire hood or put the the capsules over them, and the little neck bands. It's all hand done, and uh, because we don't do a large enough amount to warrant getting a lot of expensive uh, automated equipment so it's about as old-fashioned as you get um, our corker is a 200 year old guillotine corker it's an art, art in itself to run the thing um, so our, our it, for the most part uh, we use all that equipment on our sparkling wine uh, so this wine Blanc de Noir or white of red uh, is made 100% from hand harvested Pinot Noirs. 2011 vintage was, it was a cool year. Uh, we picked the grapes on the 16th of September. It was a Champagne clone of uh, Pinot Noir, which uh, is a clone that tends to be a little lighter in color on the skins. Uh, we, we moved them into a cooler and we immediately, uh, we chilled them down so the next day the grapes were really, really cold so that you get a little less color extraction from it. And uh, we dump the hand-picked grapes into the press, which is classic method of Champenois. They're all pressed uh, as uh, all hand-picked as whole berry. Uh, that way you don't pick up a lot of color from the skins. And as you can see by this wine, you'd never know it was made from the red wine, except that when you put it in your mouth, it has that little fleshier character that, that Pinot Noir has. Um, it was about two years in tirage, uh, I mean, for, before we started disgorging any of it. Uh, it was made for our 25th anniversary, which we uh, celebrated this year. Congratulations. Yeah. Thank you very much. I think you guys uh, at Lucas are there too, aren't you? Yeah, yeah you're about 30. <laughs> celebrating. At uh, any rate, um, we've been really happy with it. We finished it at, it's I, it's the driest wine, I think, in the group here. Certainly more drier than the sherry. Yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> it's 0.35% uh, residual sugar that was added at the dosage. 
One of the um, questions we had, Chris, was uh, have you guys considered, like, you guys enjoy, like, just kind of having that niche thing in your lineup, or have you guys considered making a, it more of a larger production item for you? Uh, no. Uh, I mean, it's, it's a lot of work, like I say, and as cathartic as it is, sometimes it's a pain in the butt that you're, you know, you're the front room's yelling at you because you're out of champagne and you don't have enough time to disgorge it. Uh, no, it's, it's one of those projects that I like to keep as a fun thing uh, that's not going to overwhelm us and in, in the work that we have to do in the cellar. If you're looking for, uh, and, and I didn't tell you the, the price on it is $29.99 a bottle for the same reason these guys don't give it away. It's an awful lot of work to make. Um, but we do make a, a, a wine called Candeo, which is more along the lines of Prosecco. Um, a little bit sweeter, but still on the dry side, and and that's kind of the wine that we put out there as a sparkling wine that that we make a much greater value. From. Okay, it's about uh, 800 cases. And that might be something that's more uh, widely available in the market. Yep, yep, for sure. That that one is uh, is pretty well distributed, uh, where uh, our sparkling wine is more of a niche market. Okay. So if they're interested in sparkling wine, maybe the best thing might be to come to Lakewood's website. Yep, that should tell you where it is, uh, or give us a call. Um, certainly you can just come to Lakewood <laughs> and get it there. And uh, Chris, just in general, uh, how you, personal feelings about Finger Lake sparkling wine? Uh, the hard work aside. Yeah, uh, well, I... I I love Fring Lake sparkling wine, and I can sit here and, and drink all these sparkling wines uh, anytime. Uh, they're always, I've been a big fan of, of, of my neighbor's sparkling wines, and, uh, and they actually have inspired me uh, on many occasions to go disgorge some more. Um, but uh, I think that, you know, is it a thing, I think was your question? Well, yeah, it's a thing. It's been a thing here for a couple hundred years, really. And uh, it, I, is it, it's a better thing now. I think everybody's doing a much more refined job of it. Uh, and, and we're using uh, great varieties of grapes for these wines and, and very classic methodologies. So I, you can put these on the table next to bubblies from the greatest places in the world. And I think we really have, have what it takes to make those wines here. Definitely, I agree with you. Well, thank you very much, Chris, and uh, lots of good information. And um, we're going to shift gears. We uh, kind of put Derek Wilbur in kind of a crazy spot here. We uh, slipped him into this group of sparkling wine, so he's being a good sport. Uh, we're going to have people change directions a little bit. But um, Derek is a winemaker for Goose Watch Winery along with Swedish Hill Winery. And um, he has with us his classic cream sherry. And uh, Derek, again, another one of our winemakers, has a wealth of knowledge. If people pick these guys' ears, uh, they could pick up a lot. They're, they're here. They'll answer any questions you have. Derek, you want to take us through a little information about how that wine was made and about a little bit about the process of it? Sure. Thanks, Jeff. Good evening. Uh, it's good we're at the end because usually sherries are drunk at the end of a meal. Um, I first started making sherries over 25 years ago um, when I worked at Whitmer Wine Cellar, which is one of the better sherry producers uh, for the last hundred years or so. Uh, sherry has a long, long tradition in New York State, um, made for well over 100 or 150 years. A couple different ways that it is made. We actually are using the same technique that was developed by a Cornell professor of Hamden in 1939. You make sherry by doing all the things to, uh, to a wine that you would not do with anything else. And all the things that they do with making these sparkling wines are exactly the opposite things you do with sherry. Sherry is an oxidized wine. It's also a fortified wine. We make our own brandy at Goose Watch. We use that to bring the alcohol to 18%. The technique we use is a traditional baking technique. It's different from the Spanish technique in making sparkling wine. We actually take the base wine, which is a blend of a number of different varieties, uh, warm it to 140 degrees Fahrenheit, and then bubble oxygen into it to oxidize it over the course of about four to five weeks. It's more, uh, making a sherry is more about process and time than it is about the varieties involved. The varieties are less important than it is in terms of how the wines are aged and how the wine is made. We started our sherry program in 2003 when we actually used a modified Solera technique where we only, only bottle a certain portion of what's in barrel at any time the stuff is aged exclusively in, in uh, American oak barrels. 
you bottle about a third of it at any one time and then top those barrels back up with a new sherry. So even though we don't vintage date this, <clears throat> it actually is a blend of about seven different uh, vintages. We've got this wine is actually about 5% from 2003 and 5% from 2005. So there's always a little bit of the previous years in that wine and time is very, very important in terms of getting that kind of nutty aroma in it. Um, we often talk about what, the, what do you serve this with. I, I particularly like it with, with uh, bitter chocolates and nuts. I think it goes great with those things. It's great on a cold night like we have here in the Finger Lakes this evening. Uh, retails for $16. We only bottle about 300 cases of this every two years. It's not something we do every single year. Uh, we're actually going to lay down some additional sherry base this next year. Stuff that will go into barrel and probably won't be bottled for like two or three years or a portion of that. So it's a specialty product, but it's something again that, that New York has a long tradition with. And at Goose Watch, we try to make things that are a little bit unique and a little bit different. And sherry so old is kind of new now, and that, you know, it sort of fell out of favor after the 60s and 70s. And we think there's a slight revival in these kinds of specialty products. Um, what were the varieties used in the sherry? Well, there's a lot of different ones in that. That was one of the questions that came in. The bases are basically, uh, the, the traditional uh, blend that was used when I first joined Whitmer's 25 years ago was, was Concord and Elvira, two old uh, American varieties. We've got a little bit of, of uh, Chardonnay in here, a little bit of Cayuga, a little bit of Delaware, a little bit of Catawba, mainly because we've been playing around with potential blends in terms of what may work and may not work in this. Again, it's more processed than variety, and we keep coming back to uh, the traditional ones. Our, our last couple of years we've done have been mainly uh, Concord and Catawba, maybe a little bit of Niagara in it. The thing you get into with that is, again, it's this, some of this wine has been around since 2003, and so there's a little bit of a lot of things in here, and it's not as important in terms of basically just time. It's, it's, an, it's a wine you can't rush. So, so one question was, could you provide us with a complete list? And it would be difficult, right? Because well, I have, the, uh, I, I'm fortunate I have a computer-based record-keeping system. I looked at this morning, just went back, and the list of varieties in years, uh, the varietal percentage went all the way down to a half percent. And so it's a lot of different things. Okay. There. Could well, I, I? Yes, it would take a lot of reams of paper to do that. Well, I think it's interesting information that I think a lot of people, when they just picked up the bottle, wouldn't realize all that went into it and all the different... Uh, trial and error involved in it and um, it sounds like a pretty neat process well i thank you very much derek and i think we're uh if we don't have any other questions i think we're going to wind up our first panel and um thank you guys very much for coming and hopefully our uh, media members enjoyed their tasting this evening and thanks again thank you. we'll take a short break and we'll have our second panel all right, welcome back to our uh, media members. We're getting set up for our second flight of the night. And um, this is really exciting for me because uh, whenever we do uh, these dessert wines and ice wines and ice wines, we get great feedback. People love them. So it's always an exciting tasting for us. And um, we're looking forward to getting some great um, questions to our panelists. Um, our first wine that we're going to be having this evening comes from Boundary Breaks. Boundary Breaks, relatively new winery. Some of you may not have heard of them. They're getting tons of buzz in the Finger Lakes. And um, we're glad to have them be part of the Finger Lakes Wine Alliance and to have them take part in these tastings so that people get to know them a little bit better. And we have the owner, Bruce Murray, with us this evening. And Bruce is going to tell us a little bit about the 2012 Late Harvest Riesling made from uh, Clone 90. So, Bruce, welcome. and. Um, if you want to give us a little bit of feedback about how that wine was made, sure. and then I'll throw some questions off to you. Sure, thanks Jeff. So as Jeff said, we're the new kids on the block here. We started by um, finding a really great site, really, on the east side of uh, Seneca Lake. We're north of Marty, we're north of Ann, and, and we had just a really ideal location. We said, let's try to make use of the, the, the experience of our neighbors and, and we planted just Riesling to start with. And now we have about 80 acres that could be planted. We planted 12 um, and we decided that we would focus on different styles of Riesling and one of those would have was the was the late harvest. And what's what's I think a little one of the ways to describe what we're doing is we're we're looking at clones so that when we've planted when we've 
manage the vineyard. We're trying to keep our clones distinct. We've made wines that are single clone wines. This late harvest is single clone wine. We don't think we've come up with a, any answers yet, but we're trying to learn and see which clones do better in our site. In this case, this is clone 90. It was harvested in, in mid-December in 2012. 2012 was a uh, warm year. So um, rather than making an ice wine, rather than freezing these grapes, we said, what if we let these grapes hang? We netted them. What if we let them hang, get a little bit of the botrytis in there, and um, harvested them at about 30 bricks, um, and uh, asked a really well-regarded winemaker in the area, Ian Barry, who now runs Ian or runs Barry Family Cellars, to make this wine for us. Very good. Um, challenges that Boundary Breaks has had being a new winery in the region. That was one of our questions that we had that was not specific to that wine, but. Um, so any new business faces challenges in, in a number of ways. In our case, I mentioned how nice the site we have is in terms of being close to the lake. It's on sloping ground. It's on the right side of the lake, but it's off the main road. So our, our realistic expectation is that the wines we make are not necessarily going to be all sold through our, our tasting room because we're off the beaten path. So we're trying to make wines that can compete outside of our market, on the shelf, in retail locations, in restaurants, where people are looking or used to buying Rieslings from other parts of the world. And so we really need to make sure that the wines we make can hold their own at good price points against other Rieslings from around the country. That's the biggest challenge. Biggest challenge and something that probably sets you aside from a lot of the other wineries in the region. Um, one of the questions we had, had that just came in from the media members, what's the suggested retail price on that wine? So this is a 375 milliliter uh, bottle, it's $29.95, a suggested retail. And what's the production of that wine? First? So we made about 120 cases. So. Um, we, in 12, we made about 120 cases. In 13, we made about the same amount of about 120 cases. And, and we just um, we just picked this morning our 14 ice wine. Great. So there's a lot of uh, folks in our panels that know why Riesling works well as a dessert style, whether it be late harvest or ice wine. Could you just mention like why you feel it does quite well? So some of our media members might get a little insight into that? So our view is that when the fruit begins to break down later on in the season, you're, you're getting flavors, you're getting characters that you don't see in, in fruit that's harvested in late September or sometime through October. So what you're getting are flavors that are earthier, you're getting caramel, you're getting honey, and you're getting botrytis. So this is the kind of thing you won't find and it, it's a uh, it's unique really and and for the for people who love this style it it's um you can't find these flavors anywhere else in any other beverage in any other food anywhere in the world very neat good information well thank you very much bruce uh i think we're going to go on. I'm going to come back to you in a few minutes. I'm going to throw a couple questions out to the whole panel in a few moments. But um, we're going to move on to our second wine of this evening. And we have with us uh, Marty Masinski from Standing Stone Vineyards. Marty is uh, one of the owners and winemakers at Standing Stone Vineyards. And she has her 2013 Riesling Ice Wine. And uh, Marty, could you take us through a little bit of how that wine was made? And also a little bit of information just about your winery. Sure. Thanks for uh, being with us. First of all, though, I'm going to correct you so I don't get in trouble. Uh, we call it Riesling Ice, and you'll notice that nowhere on the bottle do the words ice and wine appear next to each other. Okay. Uh, this is not picked frozen. Uh, we haven't done that in over a decade, I believe. 
Uh, we pick late. We want the leaves gone and we want to pick and then freeze commercially. Um, and we think that picking late is what gives us the cool flavors that we're looking for, the late harvest flavors, the nuttiness. Um, we freeze commercially because by picking late we get all the grapes instead of feeding birds, coyotes, deer, and the wind. And so we can make something that's a really great price point and really high quality. Um, uh, Riesling, we actually have two vineyard blocks and this came from a little of both. Um, one block is 40 years old and one block is six years old with this vintage. And uh, both have just gorgeous, gorgeous Riesling fruit with, um, I think the attraction with Riesling and then the Vidal that Steve's going to talk about are deliciously high acidity, which is super, super key. Um, it's not just the sweetness that make these wines so special, it's the balance and, and the acid is really important in that. So one of our questions, Marty, that came in for Standing Stone, I feel you pretty much, the fact that you're making wine in that style probably answers it, but they wanted to know if there's a flavor difference between grapes frozen naturally on the vine versus you freezing them yourself. And um, like I said, I feel the fact that you made, you and uh, your husband made a decision to do it that way probably answers that, but. That's right. Uh, I'll let you answer it. We don't think there is a difference, and I, I guess the backup I'll offer for that is we, we sell a lot of these wines. We actually make four different flavors of ice-style wines, as I call them, um, and we sell a lot of them wholesale, so they're going into a lot of restaurants and a lot of stores, and what they all like about them is the price point first, because it's something that's a price that will sell, $24.99 suggested retail, um, but the fact that the flavor um, the balance, the richness of the wines um, makes people feel like they're getting a lot more than they're paying for. And that's very, very important. And it may be that real ice wines um, to a certain number of people will sell for a lot more money. Uh, but once you start going up that pricing platform, uh, at every $5 price point, the number of customers you have available drops off. Um, so. At this price point, we can make three or four hundred cases of each of four different varieties and keep an awful lot of people really happy. Great. Um, a lot of people, uh, Marty, <laughs> look at uh, sparkling <laughs> yeah. wine, dessert wines, ice wines as uh, special occasion wines, and I feel like that price point would probably help with that. Um, do you find yourself having to change their mindset in your retail shop about not having to have a special occasion to we, enjoy we these wines? We really do and we have we have many many people that our standard tasting always includes your choice of one of the ice style wines and many people say oh no skip that just give me another red wine or dry wine and we actually say no 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 you must try it it's part of your that's why you're here it's part of the process you don't get to taste things everywhere uh, and if you really really dislike it we'll rinse your glass with Cabernet or Chardonnay or your dry wine of choice and we do make a lot of converts because there are a lot of people who've only tasted one or two dessert wines maybe they weren't the best made uh, maybe they weren't in the right setting um, but I think when they're well made and they're very balanced um, there's a much wider audience than people think but we also talk about pairing them and you know everybody thinks you have to have ice style wines or sweet wines with dessert um, they're very nice on their own they're excellent paired with a lot of cheeses um, spicy foods sometimes even people will go that far and then mixing them with bubbles sometimes makes like a little cocktail so there's a lot of ways people can enjoy these when they find the ability to think about it um, uh, we had a question uh, Marty and really any of the panelists could take could answer it too. Uh, is there an ideal sugar level for the ice wines? They're like wondering if it's 20, 24, 27. Uh, finished sugar level? Is there any? Yeah, the finished sugar level. It's kind of when they stop fermenting. Um, <laughs> there's, there's a point when the yeast just won't go anymore. So. And where you started from at the beginning, right? Yeah, yeah. Exactly. yeah. That yeah. Too. I was going to say the yeast decided. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, they, they get a little tired by the yeah, end of the fermentation. It just won't go, and uh, the yeasts don't like that high sugar uh, no. juice anyway. Yeah. Well, uh, very good, uh, uh, Marty. Lots of good information, and um, I uh, like the idea of like getting people in at a little less expensive price point to enjoy those wines. And uh, 
I think it helps let them see what we can do in the Finger Lakes with that style of wine. Well, for our third wine in this flight, we have Ann Raffetto from uh, um, Wagner Vineyards. And um, Ann has been with Wagner's for a long time and uh, has a great reputation in the region. And she has uh, another one of these uh, um, wines that's frozen post-harvest, we call it. Um, 2013 Riesling Ice. And she's going to give us a little bit of information about how Wagner's makes that wine and how it fits into their portfolio of wines. Um, welcome, Ann. And uh, you Thank want you, to Jack. take us through a little bit? You want to start off with the retail price on that wine? Yeah, um, it's $24.99. And um, you can get it at the winery, the winery website. Um, and this is what's absolutely shocking to me. You can get it at Amazon.com. Uh, <laughs> shocking. Um, and then um, also um, Total Wine and More um, carries uh, this wine in about 14 states. Great. So I know some of the So uh, there's definitely people out there who could get this. Oh, yeah. 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 And um, through the Total Wine and More, um, when they picked us up, we definitely had to um, increase our production of the ice wine. That's one that they're really quite happy with, with I think. Again, as Marty pointed out, with these ones that are um, frozen post-harvest, the price point can come in in a retail store. It's something that people are willing to try for a 375 bottle. So, um, um, Wagner started making um, the Riesling ice and Vidal ice um, in 1988. Um, I think maybe some of you folks know Randall Graham from Bonnie Dew Vineyards in California, a real um, innovator. Well, he visited the Finger Lakes and um, was talking with Bill Wagner, the founder, um, and this was the way he suggested ice wine should or ice wines should be made. Um, and Bill, sort of being the iconoclast, was like, "Sure, let's do it that way." So um, it's really the only way that I have made um, an ice wine. Um, is by freezing the grapes after. But what we do is we let the grapes get to their optimum ripeness because what that freezing process is is really a concentrating step. So we're just trying to concentrate um, those vibrant um, fruity flavors that Riesling um, does so well in our region. Um, in addition to concentrating those flavors and sugars, we're also concentrating acid. So that question sort of about the finishing residual sugar in these wines is they do jump around um, based on, I mean, at least we, I try, um, the balance, the sugar and that acidity. Um, but, um, and so they, I mean, I think our Riesling ice have jumped around from anywhere from 24% residual sugar, um, maybe down to 18 depending okay. on the vintage. Um, and one question, and because you have been making them for a long time, one of our media members had asked about um, aging the ice wines from the Finger Lakes. Yeah. Um, have wine. you tried some of the older ones of Wagner's? Yes. Um, I have an 08 in the fridge right now. Um, I tried before I came. <laughs> Just to see. That was a great vintage. Um, they, they definitely change. Um, they, I mean, obviously the colors change, the flavors meld. I mean, that acidity that we like so much seems to soften, everything integrates. Um, they're not um, what, uh, I mean, they're definitely not how they taste now, um, but they certainly are an interesting wine. Um, and you, Very fun. <laughs> yeah, you don't you do verticals? Mm -hmm. Sometimes you've done. Um, Verticals with the ice. Yes. Yeah. So sometimes yeah. maybe they uh, like it, some of the wines. They go away from some of that fresh, fruity flavors into more of the honey. And oh yeah, completely change. Very good. And um, go ahead with your. Thought oh, right? oh, I was thinking. I'm thinking now. I mean, the the most favorite thing that I like to have with the ice wines, um, and which are ripe now, are the comis pears. It just absolutely the texture melts in your mouth with these things. Little Sounds blue delicious. Cheese. Oh, it is. It is. I was. That's why there's actually the. Do you have some in the back? That's why there's 2008 ice wine in the fridge right now. Is because it's, it's pear season and it's just 
a nice way to celebrate the end of harvest too. Okay, we're gonna when we finish up, we'll be adjourning to the back. <laughs> right. <laughs> anyway, um, but um, part of again the the process that we do with um, picking the grapes and then freezing them is it's a it's a semblance of control. I mean, it allows us to have to know how much ice wine we'll be able to make. Um, I think Steve's going to talk about his frozen on the vine. Well, a lot can happen between the time the grapes are actually cold enough to harvest, um, and with our predators and birds. And it's a little tricky deciding how much you're going to leave out there. It is, and there's so many things in winemaking and grape growing that you don't have control over. That if there is something that you can control, um, I think that's the way we've kind of gone. So. Very good. Well, uh, again, Ann, I'm going to come back to you in a minute. I'm going to ask the whole panel uh, yeah. a couple questions in a few minutes. But um, we're going to move on to our last panelist who we saw in our first panel. He's wearing a different hat this time. <laughs> He's uh, got his uh, Nap Winery. He changed shirts in the back. He's with Naps now. And um, Nap Winery and Vineyard is on Cayuga Lake. And, um, Steve has a 2013 Vidal Blanc ice wine, and um, he'll talk a little bit about um, how that wine was made and the difference in the process, and then we have some questions for Steve, too. You want to start off, Steve, with uh, the price of that wine? Sure. This one is $24.95. And that maybe ends in a five, not a nine. Anyway. <laughs> just had to be different. <laughs> yeah, just had to be different. There, uh, <laughs> Uh, this is our second 13 ice wine. We, the first one we picked on January 2nd, 2013. This one was November 30th, 2013. So a whole different growing season. Um, and the longer they're out, um, I think uh, if you get the late harvest characters you're looking for and you stop it right then, that's, that's wonderful. The longer you leave it out, the more it goes into all kinds of weird things, sometimes funky things. Um, and in fact, in the uh, our 12 vintage, which was the, the one that you picked in January. Yeah, well, no, that that was 13. That's January. Also, the 12 we picked on January 3rd, 2012. That was 2011 growing season. If we remember that, that was a really tough season. Yeah. Cool. And we had, it wasn't just Botrytis. Uh, we had black rock in there actually, and the the yield was really tiny, which was a blessing. Uh, uh, so it is really tough when you leave them out there that long. But one of the things to generalize is uh, I think the uh, artificially frozen uh, grapes is more like uh, lemon meringue and then um, uh, the naturally frozen ones being out there another two months is more like um, creme brulee. It's more, um, uh, more um, complexity and character and depth and maybe a little bit of weirdness. In there, uh, but um, uh, so you get a, a lot of different things that happen, and the grapes have been dead for how long? I mean, the leaves are gone; they're just out there in the nest, going through different sure. phases, yeah. 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 freezing, <laughs> and and all kinds of things, and uh, teaching the predators and other animals <laughs> to come to your how room. to work their way through the nets. And, uh, uh, but I think we get some really neat things both ways because we do make it both ways, and I like I like both both of them for what they are. Uh, definitely, uh, there's a lot less control with the naturally done, and uh, that brings up two of the varieties you want to use. You couldn't make, I, I'll bet Niagara would be really good if you could, uh, you could artificially freeze it. Um, but it would never last that long until it naturally froze. And that's what makes Vidal a good one for it, or even Cap Franc, a few people I think you, I know you guys are making that too, but uh, the grapes have to be really sturdy, they better have some acidity if they're going to be able to make it all the way until, the, uh, until it's, I like 13 degrees Fahrenheit, but at least 18 degrees for a certain amount of time. And then we've had some mild winters the last few, uh, and we found the day when it was actually in the teens. And by the time we get them to the winery, it's in the 20s, and they're actually thawing out at that point. So it's uh, it's a lot of heartache to get what you know is beyond your control. And actually, the people who are making them post uh, frozen post harvest have a similar issue. They have to make sure it's cold enough when they're bringing when they're the bringing grapes back, back. Yeah. or go really yeah. fast. Or go really fast. Yeah. <laughs> Don't mess around. Yeah. 
Um, I'm going to ask you, Steve, and then kind of ask the other folks on the panel if they feel that climate change is making it harder or easier to produce these style wines. Well, uh, and, and is the weather less mm -hmm. predictable now than, say, when you started in the Finger Lakes? Yes, uh, not to get into whether there is climate change or not, but in the decades I've been here, there were you know, one or two really warm years a decade. Now there's four or five, and we have still really cold events. So I think we're having all kinds of weather. It just seems to be more erratic. And in fact, this November right now is, I thought last year was going to be a tough one for a long time. And already this one's here. This Not off to a very good start. Yeah, no, we're just, <laughs> it's just giving us a hint of something new. Uh, and would any some of the other panelists like to talk about um, the ability to produce these wines? Whether they feel the climate change is affecting it? Well, where we're picking and freezing post harvest, it doesn't affect it. And yeah. I think that's again right. part of the certainty, especially when we're making a quantity enough that we're in the wholesale market. That lets us balance that from year to year. And if we were waiting for Mother Nature to help we have a product line that we just couldn't support. What about like yeah. for um, those of you using like Vidal and Riesling in a hot year, you're still going to have lower acidity in those grapes. Um, so I mean hypothetically as you have hotter weather, like wouldn't those wines have less crispness and acidity to them? They concentrate as well. I mean the acid concentrates as well. But if you start out with a lower number, right, it's going to end up lower. Right, and then you work on your you work on your sugar balance. Yeah, <laughs> right. And you can also play with your crop load, and instead of you know the assumption in the Finger Lakes has always been that we have to thin things to a certain level to get them ripe, even Riesling. And in the hot years, I think leaving everything to let it rip and have lots of leaves and have lots of fruit can help give what looks like a normal crop, even in a 2010 or a 2012. Um, Bruce, would you like to add anything to the um, dessert wines and uh, like this? Well, I think a lot of people have not tasted these wines because a they're expensive and, and they're really a kind of a, um, a a unique animal. So what we've found when we bring people into our tasting room is we taste them. We make we made five different rieslings in in 2012 from dry to the dessert wine. Um, I think what we see is we open people's eyes more than anything else as they as they taste through all of them they, they, they a understand that Riesling is very versatile and then B they many of them not that sophisticated or in their own minds that sophisticated about wine discover that there's quite a range in flavors and character with all the same grape and, and putting the, the late harvest or the ice wine at the end you know is a it's just a sort of another signal of what can be done okay. in this area. We're getting uh, some questions from folks about labeling distinction between the, um, the ice wine and the frozen um, grapes. Does anybody want to talk at all about the labeling distinction? Marty? The, um, the rule is that you can, if it's not picked frozen directly into the press frozen, you cannot have the words ice and wine next to each other on the label anywhere in the main name in the varietal anywhere um, and then when they first and it was interestingly the Canadians that convinced our government <laughs> to add these rules but then when then initially you didn't have to say it but now I think they like it better and your label approval goes faster if you are not making a natural ice wine if you say made from grapes frozen post harvest um, and again, that's just clarifying with the consumer. I think 10 years ago, are there a few consumers that say, well, if it's not a real ice wine, I'm going to buy it, I'm not going to buy it. Fine. But I think a lot of consumers, okay, that explains the price, that explains what I'm getting. Now I can just taste, and if I think it's good for the price, I'm going to buy it. And so, and again, the trade loves it because if you try to sell a real ice wine at a real ice wine, natural ice wine at a natural ice wine price, in a restaurant by the glass in New York City, um, ouch. <laughs> so to have this price level works much better for the trade. Is there um, any, any of the panelists could uh, chime in on this? Uh, any grapes, like we've tried um, 
some Riesling and Vidal tonight. Um, are there any uh, grapes that are well suited for making these style of wines that folks haven't had a chance to try with our tasting tonight? We make two others. We make Chardonnay and Gewürztraminer. And Cap Franc. And Cap Franc. Yes. And anything out there that maybe some of you might like to try working with that haven't had a chance to try? You know, gray. You know, gray. We had had some um, of that in the past. We experimentally made a couple of cases of Vincent. <laughs> yep. Ooh, and Vincent has really color dark, in right? the pulp. It has it in the pulp. So yeah. most grapes don't have color right. in the pulp, and the Vincent did. So it made not as dark as I had hoped, but it was a red wine. A pretty. Yeah, yeah. Very pretty. <laughs> yeah. Very pretty. Yeah. 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 It was artificially frozen. It was very neat. Yeah. Very good. Well, um, I think we're going to uh, wrap up tonight's tasting. We haven't gotten any other questions. You guys did a great job, and I'm sure that our media members enjoyed these wines. And uh, thank you to our panelists tonight. And uh, personally, I'd like to thank our uh, Stephanie Jarvis has uh, worked for the uh, Finger Lakes Wine Alliance. This is her last official capacity helping us out. And she's done a great job for us. So uh, on behalf of the Wine Alliance, thanks, Steph, for all your hard work. And um, thank you very much. Thank, thank you, you Jeff. Yeah. Thank you, Steph. <laughs> yes.